thank you very much uh, for this kind introduction, sir. And uh, uh, as he introduced me, I'm Dr. Kashik. I'm a rheumatologist, and at present, I'm working in. Uh, thank you. Working in uh, all these places, I've got my own arthritis rheumatism center. So. The, the, the topic given to me today is uh, gout. Now, I was searching for uh, good pictures of gout. Now, I found this one, uh, which depicts that gout is a disease of kings, and it's also referred to as king of diseases. Now, as you can see, what we have is um, uh, what, what can be represented as a, a lord uh, who's indulging in lots of feasts and wine and alcohol and things like that and there is a devil putting a hot uh, burning charcoal on his foot. So that is how uh, gout is represented. Now again, I was uh, surprised to see this uh, uh, description of gout from 30 AD by Aulus Cornelius Celsus. It sort of aptly describes what we're going to talk about today in a nutshell. So let me read it out for you. Again, thick urine, the sediment from which is white, indicates that pain and disease are to be apprehended in the region of joints or viscera. Joint troubles in the hands and feet are very frequent and persistent, such as to occur in case of podagra and chiragra. See, this is very important, the next slide. These seldom attack eunuchs or boys before coition with a woman or a woman except those in whom the menses have become suppressed. Some have obtained lifelong security by refraining from wine, mead and venery. So, very aptly described back in uh, 30 AD. So, the objectives for today, uh, I'm going to keep it, I've been given 20 minutes, I'll try not to exceed it, and I, I'm trying to keep it as simple as possible on a Sunday afternoon. Um, we want to go through what is gout, who gets it, why do you get it, I mean, this is my favorite topic, is hyperuricemia the same as gout? Because there's lots of people being treated for hyperuricemia and they don't have gout. And uh, how do you treat it? What are the things available? So, as I said, gout on its own, we could speak for hours, but in 20 minutes, I'm going to touch on salient features. So, it's not going to be a, a comprehensive talk, we're just going to highlight what are important for day-to-day -day practice. So, what is gout? Uh, gout, they, sorry, uh, gout uh, is explained as a kind of arthritis, it's an inflammatory arthritis, which is brought on due to high uric acid in the serum, but not only that, that uric acid should crystallize within the joint space leading to a joint inflammation. Acute gout is usually a painful condition affecting one joint, it's a monoarthritis, most commonly affecting the first metatarsal phalangeal joint in the feet. And chronic gout occurs due to repeated inflammations and can affect more than one joint and can be associated with what's called a toe fight, which we rarely see these days due to good, uh, good treatment of gout. Uh, who gets it? Uh, everyone, but most probably older men get it. But uh, as regards to the incidence and prevalence, there are lots of data available. Most data are from the Western Hemisphere in the UK. The data is represented as 8.3 million people have got gout. I mean, this is reported gout, maybe more people have got it. In UK, uh, the primary care consultation uh, ranges from 4.2 per thousand which was in 2002, which is now increased to 4.9. I, I think there's something to do with the Western diet. And this can be seen more, more uh, uh, illustrated in the China uh, episode where the prevalence has increased from 3.6 to 5.3 per 1,000 from in, in, in the last few years, I suppose. This is due to the advent of the Western culture into the Chinese uh, culture, uh, more McDonald's, things like that. Uh, Gout in the Indian scenario, we've got Dr. Gotori, uh, who is a, I, I'm, I think she works at uh, Madras Medical College, and uh, uh, Professor Gotori's uh, assessment was of the 20,000 people they've done in the survey, 101 had gout, and there were more men than women, as we would expect. And there's a very high uric acid concentration of 8.55. Now, the concentration of uric acid is very important. We'll, we'll touch on it in a second. <coughs> and usually associated with other comorbid conditions like uh, hypertension, obesity, metabolic syndrome, diabetes mellitus, so on and so forth. So, um, 
Again, identifying gout should not stop in treating gout alone. We have to look for other comorbid conditions, thereby treat the cardiovascular, coexisting cardiovascular problems as well. Why do you get this? Uh, again, uh, with most of the treatment, most of the conditions we deal in root, I mean, actually, unlike uh, most of the conditions we deal in rheumatology, at least with gout, we know what causes it, a high uric acid causes it. But most important is why a person gets high uric acid. Now, whenever we talk about risks, I'm sure uh, you would agree there are modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors. The non-modifiable factors in this case are men, older men, and obviously African American race, perhaps not too um, applicable to where we are today. Uh, the modifiable risk factors are the increased serum uric acid levels. Diet is very important. Uh, uh, an increased consumption of sweet and aerated drinks, mainly sugar. They say diet drinks are okay, but sugary drinks are to uh, increase the uh, concentration of uric acid in the serum or increase production of uric acid. Alcohol intake is a double-edged thing. It, it actually increases uric acid production and reduces uric acid excretion. Meat, seafood, high purine content leads to breakdown of proteins, thereby releasing uric acid. Hypertension and obesity are associated with gout and also drugs, diuretics, loop diuretics. This is a, a common MRCP question we used to get. Low dose aspirin. High dose aspirin is good, not bad. It's low dose which interferes with the, re, um, the, the loop di uh, in the Henley's loop, uh, the excretion of uric acid. It leads to increased reabsorption of uric acid back into the bloodstream. Now, <laughs> Just if I could take the opportunity of posing a question to the audience, I mean, the answer is no. Uh, would you agree with that? No. No. So, would, does all hyperuricemia need treatment? Okay. Can we have a show of hands? All hyperuricemia requiring treatment? That's yes. And no? Sure. 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 So obviously, in this <coughs> forum, yes is more than no. Fine. Now, the, we have to accept that the most common risk factor for hyperuricemia uh, for gout is in fact hyperuricemia. Now, they talk about a serum uric acid concentration of 6.8 milligrams per deciliter. The reason for that is the plasma, you know, the saturation uh, factor for uric acid 6.8. Anything more than 6.8, it tends to crystallize. It sort of binds with sodium and causes monosodium urea crystals. So, whenever we talk about treatment of hyperuricemia, we have to aim for a dose uh, for a uric acid level less than 6 milligram per dl. This is the internationally agreed uh, level. So, we also need not. We should also start them on treatment and ensure that. Uric acid level is below six, so we go to treat to target. That's the uh, the mantra these days. And uh, I mean, this is a, a, a matter of debate. It's a constant debate, really. But what what they claim is gout, gout is a clinical condition where uric acid de deposition has already occurred. So hyperuricemia on its own does not mean that they have got gout. We'll explain that in a couple of seconds. So everyone accepts hyperuricemia is a risk factor for gout, but on its own may not cause gout. So it needs to be associated with other risk factors. So for example, this slide represents there is normal hyperuricemia. You add in the other factors that can lead to gout. Now, there has been a study of the Maori uh, people in Australia, the indigenous Australian people, and they have a very high uric acid level on their own but it appears that they themselves did not um, actually manifest gout. But with the introduction of the Western diet, alcohol, um, high fatty foods and purely rich foods, they, the, the incidence of um, gout is very high in the Maori population in Australia, in New Zealand actually. So this led to the, um, th there have been some studies which says, I think this is my, uh, Mike Doherty, who I had the privilege of working with. Um, the hyperuricemia is very common. So if you went to go out on the street and pick up 100 people at random, do the uric, uric acid test in them, we would look at 15 to 20% having hyperuricemia. But 
yes, this needs to be kept an eye on. They need to be uh, taught about uric acid lowering uh, diets, alcohol advice, and all that thing. But whether starting them on uh, xanthine oxidase inhibitors or uh, uric acid lowering therapy is an object of contention. We'll touch upon that in a second. <laughs> Obviously, we talked about it before. Other risk factors. So, uric acid on its own is not the main risk factor. It is the main risk factor, but there are other contributory factors. And the contributory factors are the lifestyle, high fatty food, obesity, obesity, diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease. Now, there was a survey of 500 people with gout done, and it was identified that most of them had four of the comorbid condition. 10% had seven comorbid condition, and 75% of them had hypertension. So when you see a person with gout, once again, to reiterate the point, when you see a person with gout, suspected gout, we got to check not only the uric acid, but their blood pressures, their cardiovascular status, triglycerides, cholesterol, lipid profile, and so on. Uh, sorry, I'm not able to move this slide. Yes. So there was this, um, um, this is from a USA national survey, and they identified that people with gout, there's 62.8% uh, prevalence of metabolic syndrome, which is, as you know, obesity, insulin resistance, hypertension, so on and so forth. There's 62.8% uh, had, sorry, the subjects with gout had a 62.8% prevalence as opposed to the 25% of the general population. And similarly, there was another Mexican study, and they identified at least uh, one of the following were seen in people with gout. So there was, as we discussed, nothing new. Cholesterol, obesity, hypertension, hyperglycemia, low HDL, chronic renal impairment, diabetes, ischemic heart disease. So once again, think about comorbid conditions in people with gout. Now I'm not going to spend lots of time on clinical features. I'm sure um, everyone knows about gout. It usually, it's what's called podagra. It affects the first MTP joint normally seen there. It causes um, uh, a very acute inflammation. There is the swelling of the surrounding um, skin, uh, edema of the surrounding skin, and it is such a rampant inflammation, it also leads to uh, desquamation. The skin actually sheds after some time. And uh, it, it can, left on its own, it can lead to erosions and, and, and in the long term can produce toe fighting. So um, I'm not going to touch, dwell on it a long time. So, treatment. Now, this is one of my favorite slides. I don't know how many of the audience present here are surgeons. Can I have a show of hands of surgeons? Good, not many. So hopefully, people will take this in the light of me. So we have something called Loeb's Laws of Medicine. Anyone heard of Loeb's Laws of Medicine? Yeah. The laws of medicine dictate, if what you're doing is helping, keep doing it. If what you're doing is not helping, stop doing it. Very simple things. The most important law, I think, which applies to all of us is if you do not know what to do, do nothing, leave it, don't touch it. But this is my favorite law, doing rheumatology. Most of all, never let a surgeon touch your patient. That's the most important thing. Okay. I'm sorry, this is, just a, this is setting the light of vain. Uh, so, coming back to the same question, do we treat hyperuricemia? I already know what your feelings are on this. Now. What we are talking about is asymptomatic hyperuricemia. So it's an incidental finding, not because of, it wasn't tested, it was a test as a part of a routine um, renal function or renal profile. And this is what the EULA, which is the European League Against Rheumatism, say in 2006. Asymptomatic hyperuricemia does not equate to gout, and currently there is no evidence to support treatment of isolated hyperuricemia with urate lowering therapy. And then we have a newer uh, one from 2011. This is um, once again guidelines and management. Uh, it's an international society. Treatment of patients with asymptomatic hyperuricemia should never be initiated with urate lowering therapy. So that's the, the, the I mean, I, I guess this is more due to uh, the, the risks associated with xanthine uh, oxidase inhibitors. And, uh, I mean, once again, we see a lot of people uh, being diagnosed as gout, started on tanking oxygen inhibitor, and whether they 
did actually have gout in the first instance is always a question mark. So the, this perhaps might help us in increasing the specificity and sensitivity of our diagnosis. So the ULR says we should have a composite of the four of the following. Um, rapid pain and swelling, so the new onset, sudden onset pain and swelling, they wake up in the morning with a swollen foot. Erythema, the entire leg is, uh, is red, the joint is red. Podagra, which is the first MPP joint classical presentation. Why do, uh, the, the, the reason for the distal joints being involved is uh, the uric acid crystallizes at lower temperatures, which is why usually the crystallization happens in the uh, distal parts of the body. And hyperuricemia, obviously, on uh, a blood test and to to find. So all these, if you have four of these, then we can make a diagnosis of gout. But the confirmatory test is not having high uric acid. The confirmatory test is demonstrating monosodium urate crystals in the inflamed tissue. Actually, some, some uh, reports go as far as to say, not only really demonstrating the MSU crystals, it is a phagocytosed MSU crystal. So it should be within the macrophage. So they should demonstrate a crystal within the macrophage is a confirmatory uh, test for gout. And I think this we need to uh, do have to accept non-specific joint pain. So we, we see lots of people with fibromyalgia, muscle pain, strain, whatever, and they do a test and they have a high, a slightly high urate level. And I don't think we should label them as gout. We need to um, demonstrate more robust evidence before starting them on any treatment for gout. So how do we treat the acute gout? Who prescribes colchicine? Any show of hands please? Colchicine? Good. Anti-inflammatory NSAIDs? Okay. Steroids? Do we prescribe steroids for gout? Can we? Okay. Uh, I mean, the three main classes usually used is non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, colchicine, and corticosteroids. Now, the problem since 2004 is, if you look at the, the demographic population who's got gout, are the ones with renal problems, hypertension, diabetes, uh, cardiovascular problems, cerebrovascular problems. So it actually limits the use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So yes, it, it, they, all three are equally efficacious. There is no harm in prescribing any one of those. But the non steroidal drugs, we find it difficult to prescribe them. So colchicine is a good drug, but the problem with colchicine is it leads to lots of side effects. So if you prescribe it more than two, um, 500 micrograms, so if you prescribe more than 2,000 micrograms or 2,400 micrograms, in some parts of the world it comes as 600 micrograms, uh, then it leads to lots of side effects. So I personally use corticosteroids, so it's effective, single dose, it reduces inflammation, very effective. You can give us tablets, intramuscular injection or intraarticular injection. But there is no difference, you can choose which you prefer, provided looking at the comorbid conditions of the patient. But the most important thing is quick initiation, immediate initiation, 12 to 24 hours, because it's a very, very, very painful condition. It is being mistaken for fractures in many people. Um, when do we commence serum uric acid lowering treatment? I mean, this is, I think this is a rule of the thumb, which I've been following, and there is some reports on this. We use xanthine oxidase inhibitors, which is pegosustan, xyloric, allopurinol, whatever. Uh, repeated attacks of gout, more than three attacks a year. So, first attack of gout settles on its own, perhaps we can wait, uh, control the inflammation, and then see what happens. Repeated attacks, yes. Uh, more than three attacks in a year treated. Abnormal renal function, any uh, which impedes the re uric acid excretion, we have to treat it. You start uric acid lowering treatment. In patients on diuretics, so co prescription of diuretics, yes, we have to treat it. And capacious gout, because we have to dissolve the crystals, yes, we need to use serum uric acid lowering therapy. So these are, this is the rule of the thumb. I mean, obviously, situation changes, how bad the disease is, who, who has the disease. But if you can follow this, then it will be standardized as who we treat. And more importantly, serum uric acid lowering therapy should not be commenced in the first six weeks. So we settle the attack, wait for six weeks, and then commence it. Because immediate institution can worsen the problem. Allopurinol or fibrosystatin. 
How am I doing for time? Sir? You have 30 seconds to go. Alright, I better be quick. So, albuterol, fibrocystine, both are zinc oxidase inhibitor. So, if you look at um, what uh, the there's a head-on trial, and it has been identified that fibrocystine 80 milligram is perhaps slightly better than allopurinol in reducing the serum uric acid level. But obviously, they used 300 milligrams, and we could use up to 600 milligrams or even more of allopurinol. Uh, obviously, you have risks of uh, renal problems. And they've also tried this, more important thing is allopurinol has to be used with caution in people with real impairment. And there has been a study, the same looked at the subgroup study, subgroup analysis with real impairment and found that was uh, that was in fact better in people with real impairment. So if someone has got real impairment, we perhaps prefer fibrocystat. But, um, I mean, I, as you, I'm, I'm, the nice guidelines which we follow uh, rigidly in the United uh, in United Kingdom uh, clearly states that Pegostat uh, is good, but it is more expensive. But I'm not sure about India. I think uh, not much of a difference between the two, allopurinol and Pegostat. Um, so, uh, which is why, from a cost-effective perspective, it says first try allopurinol, and if there is no response, then try Pegostat. Uh, now, I just have to check on um, uricosuric drugs. We have prevenicid and sulfinpyrazone used, used in the past. Well, it, the, the, the use is waning at the moment because A, not very efficacious, and B, once again, lots of side effects and can't be used in people with renal impairment, which is mostly our demographic. And there is a drug called benzbromerone, which is very good, can be used in renal problems, not, uh, but it causes hepatic damage. So it is not approved for use in U USA, UK, but available for name patient basis from Spain. I mean, this is in the UK, I don't know about India. So. Uh, I'll check and let you know. Uh, Benz Bromarone, there is a drug. And uh, as regards to diet, everyone knows we have to avoid a couch potato living and lots of meat and wine and obviously um, take a lot of vegetables. Now, there is also some um, uh, debate among curing rich vegetables, you know, like tomatoes and things like that. There is the, the, it's clearly being shown that vegetables doesn't have enough amount of curing, so we don't need to advise restriction of any protein or curing from a vegetable um, um, source. And uh, hopefully I have gone through what we were meant to go through, so I will stop there and if you have any questions I'll take it. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. It is No, no, it is. Hyperuricemia is uh, a risk factor for cardiovascular disease, yes, it be. But what what the advice is whether to reduce the hyperuricemia with medication or do you go for treating the cardiovascular problems and trying to ad address the diet issues, the lifestyle issues. That's where the debate is. Hyperuricemia needs to be taken seriously, no debate. But if you throw in the side effects, I mean, obviously these things were brought in. When allopurinol is a slightly riskier drug, lots of, I mean, if you give uh, allopurinol to 10 people, 5 people come back saying they're not able to take it for one reason or the other. Fibuxostat, I have to agree. The, but obviously, the, uh, we've been using Fibrocystat regularly for the past two years, and the, the uptake is better, people are better, the reduction in uric acid is better, but then we worry about uh, um, liver damage, cardiovascular problems. So, throwing, having, bearing in mind the problems, the side effects associated with the drug, that is when the debate comes in, do we have to treat it or not? So, it's a tough question. I'm, you can't choose, I accept, but these are the things I'm throwing out there. So each one needs to uh, uh, maybe tailor the treatment on a patient-by-patient -patient basis. What is the incidence of recurrence and involvement? Recurrence, sorry, sir? What is the incidence of recurrence and involvement? No, no, yeah, yeah, the, the recurrence rate is very, very high. I mean, there is always, this is, if, if untreated, the recurrence rate is high, so which is why uh, the involvement of the bone, once again, the erosions which we used to see quite a lot, has actually come down. I mean, 
we are talking about maybe three, four years ago, the only drug we had was allopurinol. And if you have allergic reactions to allopurinol, then there was no drug. We have to treat the, the acute attacks with uh, 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 steroids or whatever, which had to use. And we can't put them on long-term insects. So the problem was they ended up with lots of erosions, lots of tofi, and they, they did suffer, they did impact on the lifestyle. With the advent of newer treatment, there is raspberry uricase, and, uh, which we didn't touch on, lack of time. Uh, the involvement of the bone is steadily coming down. We rarely see tophaceous gout, the new onset tophaceous gout these days. But uh, it's, it also depends on alcohol consumption and all that. So I don't know about uh, Chennai. Do we have a high alcohol consumption rate? Yeah. Sure. Compared to next, first is Punjab, next is Tamil. Is it? Yeah. Das Mark. Yeah. Very good. So you have some experiences from the You were uh, personally experienced and you were marked. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I, as I said, the Fabulous Sister has been, I mean, we used to struggle. Uh, once again, my experience is outside the country. So we struggled with allopurinol. We had to go for allopurinol metabolites, which is also available on a name patient basis. But then, Ben's bromuro, we had, we had to import molecules. But then with Fevoxistat, which is being freely available, we, we, there was not... We are available, yeah, the efficacy. Efficacy, which is what I'm saying. My, my experience is limited, which is what I'm trying to say. It's a one-year experience. Yeah, the treatment... Uh, and very good. Good. We, we try 80 milligrams, and the uric acid reduction is fantastic. How yeah. many? They say five, five months a week, and then uh, you can check it. Uh, no, we, 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 because once again, I normally started 80 milligrams. We, actually, you can also do 120 milligrams for one month and see whether we got a, we are going to target 6 milligrams, below 6 milligrams is where we have to go to and then reduce it to 8 and then maybe reduce it to 40 after 6 months, that's what I try and do. Okay. Will you be able to reverse the damage? Of, of the toe pipe, dissolution of toe pipe, yes, but it's going to be very, 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 very slow. The smaller ones will resolve, but if you got a, I mean the one slide I showed, that will never resolve.